Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, good morning to uh, all of you out there that's watching by way of media today. Uh, we just uh, praise the Lord that we're able to be in the house of the Lord and be able to worship together. And uh, we encourage those of you that are watching, if you feel like uh, it's time where you could come back, we'd love to see you in the house together with us. But uh, the Lord is good to us, and we're trusting that he'll continue to guide and direct, and uh, we can eventually get this old thing out of the way and, uh, and do good, right? And so let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we do just rejoice in you, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are God. And, uh, Lord, that you uh, are the one who uh, uh, gives us life. Uh, Lord, you're the one who created all things. Uh, God, you're the one today who will teach us. Uh, the Spirit of God leads us into all truth, and so we thank you for that. We thank you, God, that uh, you've given the, those that can sing the voices and the, the talents to be able to play, and I thank you, God, for the music that we'll be able to lift up to you uh, this morning. I pray, God, that uh, as we study the Word of God today, that, Lord, you would take the passage to be able to use that in our lives, God, that we would have ears to hear uh, what the Spirit is saying to the church. And, Lord, I pray... Uh, that God, as we hear it, that, Lord, we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but we would do what the word of God says, be, be doers of the word, or that we would apply it to our lives. I pray, God, for anyone that's here this morning or is watching by way of media that's never given their life to Christ. God, I do pray that, Lord, uh, you, Spirit of God, would draw them to yourself, and, Lord, they'd realize who you are, and uh, they would trust in you, as many of us uh, have trusted in you. So, Lord, we love you today. We thank you for who you are, what you will do in this place and out. And so we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All to praise you. Come lead us this morning. Good morning. We're going to begin by worshiping the Lord in song. If you could stand with us.
There we go. 
Genesis chapter 14. We'll look at first 16 verses this morning. And I've titled the message, Faith That Is Courageous. Faith That Is Courageous. Uh, for years have asked people, well, I heard it one time, let me just say it this way. I heard it from a preacher one day as uh, we were at a conference, and he said, uh, how are you faithing? I thought, well, that's an interesting question. It's not how are you doing, but he said, how are you faithing? And uh, I thought about that for a long time. Uh, you know, every day you would wake up and you would think, uh, well, I wonder how my faith is today. How is my faith going to be today? Uh, so let me ask you the question, how are you faithing? How's your faith today? Do you uh, just, uh, can you just say that you have faith? Uh, there are those who can say they have faith, but do you have courageous faith? Uh, when things come that, uh, against you and, uh, and uh, it's time where you need courageous faith, uh, have you ever had that? Do you have that? So really that's what the message is about today, is this courageous faith. And we see Abram, uh, the one who had it, uh, de demonstrating and showing us how we're to live our life. Uh, with this courageous faith. So, uh, you know, war is not a pretty picture. Uh, war is not meant to be that way. Uh, when we send our young men and women into arms way, and uh, normally there's great tragedies and things that take place in war. Even today, uh, we have those that are there doing that. But war is not a pretty picture. Here in Genesis uh, 14, we uh, have the first recorded war. Uh, I don't know if you read through the Old Testament. Somebody says, well, I don't like reading through the Old Testament because it's not interesting. Well, it is because the Old Testament see a lot of first things. Uh, and you see things that's not happened yet. And, uh, and we learn from them. And, and, and even uh, there have been those who have uh, created their military str uh, strategies, really, around uh, some biblical wars in which they read about. And so... Uh, it, it can be interesting, but we find the first recorded war doesn't mean that there hadn't been skirmish uh, uh, wars before uh, and that there had not been uh, those that battled against one another prior to this. It just means that we have the first recorded war. And so it's the, it's the first one that's really written about, uh, given a description really of the battle and how they went about the battle. And uh, it's, not the, uh, it's not the purpose of the message really today, but it is there, and so I want to make sure that you understand that purpose of this chapter is to show Abram's courageous faith, Abram's courageous faith, and to teach us how that we can have it as well. And so uh, when we think about Abram believed God uh, when all the odds were against him as we read the story. So let's read beginning in verse 1 of chapter 14. In those days, King, uh, and these are some tough words, and so bear with me as we try to make through these. Uh, in those days, King Amraphel uh, in, of Shinar, King Ariot of Eleazar, uh, King uh, Shador Laomer of Elam, and King Tidal of Goyim uh, waged war against King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King uh, Shinab uh, of Adma, and King uh, Shemember of Zeboim, as well as the king of Bela or Zoar. And all of these came as allies to the Siddim Valley, which is the Dead Sea area. And so uh, they were subject to uh, Shador Laomer of, for 12 years. So they paid, they paid, they took, he took care of and made sure that they did this unto them. But the 13th year, it says, they rebelled. In other words, we've had enough. And so in the 14th year, uh, Shador Laomer, the kings and the kings who were with him came, defeated uh, the uh, Rephaim uh, in Ashtoreth, uh, Carnaim, uh, the Zuzim uh, in Ham, the Emim in Sheve, uh, Karathiam, and the Horites in the mountains of Seir, as far as El Paran by the wilderness. Then they came back to invade in Mishpat. Uh, that is Kadesh, and they defeated the whole territory of the Amalekites as well as the Amorites who lived in Hazazon uh, Tamar. And then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, 
uh, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, uh, went out and lined up for battle in the Siddim Valley against King Shador Laomer of uh, Elam, uh, King Tidal uh, of Goyim, and King Amaraphel of uh, Shinar, and King Ariot uh, of Eleazar, uh, and four kings against five. Now the Siddim Valley contained many asphalt pits, and even today we find evidence of that. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them. But the rest fled to the mountains. But for the four kings took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food and went on. doesn't say that about the other areas. They also uh, took Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions, for he was living in Sodom, and they went on. One of the survivors came and told Abram, uh, the Hebrew, who lived near the oaks belonging to Mamre, uh, the Amorite, the brother of Eshkel, and uh, the brother of Anar. Uh, they uh, were bound by a treaty with Abram. And when Abram uh, heard that his relative had been taken prisoner, he assembled his 318 trained men. Interesting that they give a number for that. Born in his household, and they went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he and his servants de deployed against the uh, them by night and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah uh, to the north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also his relative lot and his goods and as well as the women and the other people. And so we'll, we'll stop it there. Verse 16. Uh, you go home, practice those names. Next week we'll have a test on all of that. Anyway, so we find that Abram believed God against all odds when it came to the war. And that is what courageous faith does. It looks at uh, the obstacles that are there, and it looks at what we have, and it says, you know, what we have can't match up to what we see. And, uh, but Abram didn't see it that way. We don't find any hesitation. We, we don't find him uh, going, and we don't find him having conversation with those 318 men. We don't have, have him saying, you know, look, men, listen, we only 318 of us, and there's a... Uh, uh, these, na these nations that have gathered together themselves and they've gone to battle and, and what do you think? You think we could have a chance? When, what do you think some of those men might would have said? No, I don't think we have a chance. But they knew Abram was a man of faith and they trusted him. That's interesting in the story. Because then we find that he uh, takes these men, 318 of them, which also tells us that there were more than 318 of them uh, he had, remember, lots of flock and lots of people that took care of those things. And so he had 318 that had been trained. So they, they had been working at understanding how to fight because there were times when they might need to fight. Every nation had to have a group of people just as they are today. So he had these 318 men out of all the people that he had. We don't know how many of those were of all the people that he had there, but we know he had 318 that were trained. And so that's interesting. And so... Uh, you may not know this, but uh, there has only been about 300 years of peace without war on earth, according to the historians. And so uh, the Bible says that there will always be wars and rumors of wars. And so when you think about that, you think ever since the, the beginning, there's been wars and rumors of wars. And it's been exactly as the Bible has told us that it would be. But the final war, there will be a final war, you know. And isn't it interesting that God gave us the record of that, that we know that there's going to be a final war? He gave it to us in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9. It says that when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. God has the final say, does he not? I want to tell you, God always has the final say. We may rebel against God, we may do whatever we want, but I'm telling you, God's going to have the final say one day. And uh, he, he will uh, end it all right here in this battle we find in Revelation. So why did this war in Genesis happen? Why did it come about? Well, there were kings who refused, according to the story, they refused to uh, pay tribute, if you will, pay money unto uh, King uh, Shador uh, Loamer, and uh, to pay uh, tribute money unto them. So four kings went out 
And notice that they paid it for 12 years. They had done it for a long time. And then, but they were tired of it. And I'm sure they were tired of it the first year. But they went 12 years by doing it. And we don't have the story to know whether the, there was an increase of money every year and they, they was getting to the point of where it was becoming harder for them to do it. And anyway, they got fed up. And so they rebelled in the 13th year. Now, we don't know if they rebelled at the beginning of the 13th year, or the middle of the 13th year, at the end of the 13th year. But I like to think that they rebelled uh, not at the end of the 13th year, but somewhere between the first and the middle part of the 13th year. And, and so then they devised a plan, uh, uh, Ch -lo, uh, Shador -lo Amar, excuse me, and uh, he devised a plan in order to come and attack them because, hey, listen, you're, you're going to pay me my money. So he begins to put together a plan, and it says that he did that in the 14th year. Now, if there wasn't a period of time of gap there, there would not have been a reason to give the 13th year, 14th year, 12th year. So he gives it for a reason to let us know that there was a time span there in order to, for preparation for the war that would take place. And so hopefully we can all agree today that uh, we need faith and that we need to live by faith. Doesn't the Bible say that we need faith? If we're going to believe in God, you have to have faith to believe in God. And the, and the Bible says that we're not only to have faith in order to get saved, but we're to walk by faith, live by faith, we're to have faith. According to the passage here, we see that we're to have courageous faith. So I want to give you three main points this morning related to the message. First one is the need for courageous faith. We need courageous faith. There are times in our life that come that, that uh, requires us in order to have that. Now, I'm, I've seen people that's not had courageous faith, and I've seen them collapse in the midst of, uh, of, of battles and things that come in their life, and you find them becoming depressed and just downtrodden, and you find them even lose all they have, and you see people all over the world, or really the world, but really in our United States, that, that are homeless people. Now, some of them are homeless because they, they found themselves in situations where they didn't have any faith. Now, faith is not something that we work up. It's not something that we uh, exercise every day related to who we are, per se. It's faith that we exercise related to who God is. It's God's faith that we need. It's God's faith that we're to walk by. God's faith that we're to live by. God's faith that is to direct us and show us which way we're to go. And, and he's the one that gives us the courage to be able to do it. The courageous faith. Abraham, looking at the situation as we'll get to it, sees that there's, he only has 318 men. Now, I don't know how he called the men. He said, hey, get all the men together. And I know, I know all of you have been working, but there's only 318 of you that's really prepared. I'm telling you, all 318 of you, come with me. We're going to battle. And I could just hear the report there, but he needed faith. He needs faith. We need faith. We begin to see some things related to Sodom. Sodom coming back up in the picture because that's where Lot uh, lived. And uh, Sodom was not a... A uh, free, independent city. Uh, it was bound city, if you will. Sodom and other cities had been under these 12 years of bondage from this king. And uh, they couldn't operate. Not, not only was Sodom there, but you need to understand, lots of part of that Sodom. That means Lot's part of paying the tribute money. He's got to pay that. And remember when Lot went there and uh, he was with Abram, they looked out over the land and he gave him the choice and he had all these animals and all these people and all this stuff and there wasn't enough room to take care of it so we know he was a wealthy man. So he goes to Sodom. So we find in the story that uh, they, they, not, they don't go to the other cities and try to get all this stuff. We don't know that if they got any of that stuff but that's not in the story. We know that in Sodom they get all the stuff because why? Because they knew that in that city, which, remember, was the worst in the world at the time, that in that area that there were great wealth, and so they chose to go there in order to get the wealth. In other words, if you're not going to pay me just my little bit of tribute money, then I'll come take everything you've got. You have a choice. You had a choice. Choice, give me a little bit, live on the rest you got, or I'll come and get it all. And that's what he chose to do. And so an interesting fact is that some of the nations that raided Sodom and her allies were in the area that we call today Iran and Iraq. So when we think about the area, I want you to understand where we are in the story. Elam uh, was named after one of Noah's grandsons, Elam, uh, the son of Sham. And uh, Abraham came from the son, uh, or came from the line of Sham. And so the way the four nations took out 
the five nations was one at a time. In other words, they didn't say, you guys go over here and take care of that area, you guys go over here. No, they took one at a time, and they marched from a certain way in which they went. They uh, set out to, to go and to capture all of these. They went in a circle starting from the east, then to the south, and then to the west in order to capture all of these. And so in the midst of this war, Lot uh, was taken captive and all that he owned, it said. Not just him, but everything that he had, they took. That took a while to get all that and take it. Well, then Lot was like a, he was like a son, we know, of Abram. And even we find that in the scriptures that tells us that. He treated him as one. He loved him. And uh, so as he gets word of this, he knows that uh, he's going to go to battle. And so in verse 12, we read of Lot's capture and we learn that Lot is living in Sodom. Now that's interesting in the passage because if we backed up in the passage and went back to where we've already studied, we'd find that when Lot went to and took all of his stuff and chose his land, that he went and he pitched his tent outside of Sodom. So now he's not outside of Sodom, he is now inside of Sodom in the city. That means that he's not living in a tent, that he's went in, he's got a permanent dwelling place. In other words, when you normally get a permanent dwelling place, you're telling people that, hey, I'm not planning on moving. Those that lived in the tent were uh, nomads, and I remember going to Israel and going out into the countryside, and even today, if you go out there, you find that there are nomads living out in tents, big black tents you see all over the place. And so they, this is what Lot was doing. He was, he was living that way, but then he decided he'd go inside the city. So he goes, and he's now permanently in the world, if you will. He doesn't have a plan to come out of the world. Well, God will always try to have grace to draw people back in to get them to obey and to do what they're supposed to do. So we find that in this situation that we know Lot finds himself, he has an opportunity to, to go against all of that and to come back with Abram and, and to listen to what Abram's got to say and to, and to obey God. We'll learn more about that as we, as we go in the, in the text. Not in the text today, but we will. And so that is what sin will do to you. Can I tell you what it will do? Just like Sodom went further into, uh, I mean, Abram went further into Sodom and lived there. Listen, we'll get deeper into sin than we want to be and we'll stay longer than we want to stay. When we continue to yield to things and we take one step and we know we didn't get caught, we know nobody's saying anything about it, and so we end up enjoying what we're doing. And then before you know it, we take another step into the world and we do something else and we say, you know what, this feels good because I'm telling you what the devil will do. He's got that hook out there. He's got, it's got a great bait on it. And before you know it, he hooks you in all those things. He gets you to taste it and you like it. It's like somebody that goes fishing and they go out there with a certain kind of a lure or a certain kind of a worm or, a, or a, a whatever it is they're using to fish with and, they, and it's a good day and they throw it out and they get a fish and they pull it in and they realize that that bait's working. So I'll throw another of the same bait out and I'll pull another one in and we stay there all day as long as we're catching fish. And I tell you, that's what the devil, if he knows what he's doing to your life, trying to get you hooked and draw you into the things of the world, he'll continue to use that. Well, and in the midst of all of this, the world shows up. We didn't plan that one. Anyway, y'all get a bonus tomorrow. All right, where was I? Well, the way the four nations... Uh, took on those was in, in a miraculous way. They defeated them. Now, they didn't have enough either, but they defeated four nations, defeated five nations. And then we're going to find that now five nations has de- four nations has defeated the five nations, and we're going to find 318 men are going to go against those four, four nations. What a story it is. And so th- that is what sin will do. It'll, it'll keep you longer than you want to stay, as I said. Well, Lot lost all that he had. He was left with the clothes that was on his back. What if today you were to lose everything that you had and you were left with the clothes on your back? Almost every month, almost every month, someone sleeps on our property. Almost every month. There's been a guy that's been, he doesn't do it every, every night, but uh, he has done it for the last month several times. And he sleeps in the corridor of the second building over there, the little breezeway, and he sleeps close to the door, 
And so I've learned over the years of being a pastor and coming into church properties that you don't just come in and park your vehicle and get out of your vehicle. Uh, I had one guy that uh, was using the bathroom at the steps one morning when I drove up. I, I could just go story after story after story over years of what I've seen. And so I met this guy that was out there as I drove my car around, and I always make a, a, a long, a big, wide sweep to make sure that there's nobody on the property. And I found this guy. And, and I looked at him, and, I, and he told me his name. His name is Jim. And I said, Jim, uh, he said, I've, I've been kicked out of my home. I don't have anywhere to go. He said, I've just slept here this, tonight. I said, okay, Jim. I said, but you, you got to go. And so Jim goes, and Jim comes back. Jim, Jim doesn't have anything. I, and I've seen a lot of guys who they store their clothes over behind the air conditioning unit that comes to this building. And, 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 and they've done a lot of things. They've stayed in our, uh, they've stayed in our facilities down below. They've, I mean, they've, they've been everywhere. But Jim doesn't have anything. He doesn't have a, a pack. Now, he may have it somewhere else, but he's got the clothes on his back. And I tell you, that's what we find with Lot today. We find Lot, he's had everything taken from him, and he has nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but if you lost everything, don't you think you'd begin to think about life? What, what life has done to you, where you are, what you need to do, where you need to be? Can I ask you a question this morning? Where's your life at today? Is your life, does it have courageous faith? Is it, are you walking with God? Or, are you sincere about, about what you say that you have, that you, you trusted Jesus as your Savior and you want to walk with Him and you want to know what it is to have this Christian life? Or is it that, you don't, uh, that you've walked away from God? Now, you might not be like Lot. You may not went down to Sodom, and you may not be in that position. But maybe you're not where God wants you to be this morning. We need, to, we need to think about that. Every time we hear the Word of God preached, we ought to think about, where am I, Lord? God, what is it today that you want to teach me? What is it today, God, you want to show me? God, what is it today that I need to do, God, that my life might be more like you? Because isn't that what life's supposed to be about as a Christian? We're to be more like Christ. Well, Abram, a man which was right with God, would receive word about Lot and all that had happened, and he begins to take action. Boy, he didn't hesitate. He, 318 men, and let's get together, and, and let's go. And he, he, he devises a plan, and they go to, in order to get his, son, his, uh, his nephew back, which he called his relative, which it was. And so we know that a survivor who must have known that Abram uh, was Lot's uncle and he came and he told Abram what had happened. Somebody came and told Abram what had happened. Somebody had given a report of what had happened. Now, they had to know that there was a relationship between him and Lot. And so he comes and he tells. And so people seek others during times of crisis, don't they? I, I think about, I thought about as I was uh, doing this message and putting it together that, uh, you know, we, we can look at 9-11. We always look at that, look back at that. And you think about during that time, boy, people were flooding into the churches, were they not? And uh, boy, they wanted answers, and, and they, they wanted to know, and, you know, boy, I need to know about this God, and I need to know about this faith, and I need to know about these things. And then as everything began to calm down and everything was getting back to some uh, normalcy, what ended up happening? Those people went right back out of the church, went back out in the world, began to do the same thing they'd always done. And that's what we find. People uh, seek during times when they need help, and that's exactly what's happened. They, nobody had been over to Abram and said, hey, won't you come and visit Lot? Lot needs you, man. Lot's gone deeper into the world. He's moved into the city. Why don't you, we don't find that in the story. But listen, why didn't somebody come then? No, they waited until the crisis. That's what we do many times. We're not out seeking people to try to help people in their times of need. Do you think this world's full of people that have needs? Yes. But we're not out here trying to help people who have needs. We don't want to wait until there's a crisis in their life, and then we have an answer for them. In other words, we wait for them to come to us. That's what happened here. Abram wasn't going until somebody came to him. Well, people seek others that way during times of crisis. Abram is called upon. What did he do? In verse 13, the word Hebrew is used. It's the first time in Scripture. We find the first war in this passage. We find the Hebrew mentioned the first time in this passage. And uh, called Abram a Hebrew. Uh, the first name Abram, it was the first uh, name that he was given, and his descendants were called. And the name means, if you've never known this, beyond on the other side, referring to the other side of a river, the Euphrates River. 
is what he's talking about. And God has set Abram apart from the surrounding people. In other words, he's being set apart unto God. Is that not what God wants to do in all of our lives? He wants us to be set apart unto him. Our allegiance is to be to him. We're to be sold out to him. We're to be yielded to him. We're to do whatever he tells us to do and no one else. And so Abram is being sold out, really, unto God. God has set Abram apart from the surrounding people. The name would later be used for the Jewish people and uh, for the nation of Israel. The Hebrew people, we know them as. So what would now be needed by Abram? It would be the great courageous faith is what would be needed of Abram. As he looked at the 318 men, and he tells them, this is what we've got to do, guys. We've got to march out, and we've got to go get my nephew back. That was his main concern. The individual that came to Abram uh, would witness great faith in action. What? This guy came and told Abram, but he didn't know exactly what Abram would do. He, he didn't know that Abram didn't have armies like uh, maybe the others had. Well, we find in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, these words, look at it. We are to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks for you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We're to be ready to have an answer. We ought to always be ready for whatever comes our way. Someone comes, we ought to be able to give them an answer. My sister called me the other day. She was watching a movie. Jane and I happened to be in a store, and I answered the phone, and she was asking me about something, and the way she described it to me, I couldn't give her an answer. I thought, my goodness. I said, I don't know. She said, you're a preacher, and you don't know? I said, well, I, I know, but I don't know. I said, I know, but it ain't coming to mind right now. I couldn't think of it. Well, finally, I went over to Jane, and I said, here's what she's asking. And Man, she was Johnny on the spot. She she said it was leprosy. I said, man, why couldn't I think of that? And I told my sister, well, she said, well, thank you, Jane. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't ready. Can I tell you, we need to be ready always. Now, the older we get, sometimes it's hard to be ready. It, uh, we know the answer sometimes, but we can't give the answer. People may despise believers when everything is going good. But I tell you what, they love believers when things are going bad. You ever had people come to you and say, hey, will you pray for me? You know they're lost people, but you know they, they believe you got, you're in tune. You believe you've got an avenue into heaven. So they, they come to you and say, hey, pray for me. And then they'll come and ask you again, pray for me. Oh, I've heard it over and over and over and over again. I've had people come and do the same thing with me, pray for them. It's an opportunity not only to pray for them, it's an opportunity also to share with them. And say, listen, I know you think I have an avenue under the, under, under the Lord, and I do because I know the Lord. But you could also have an avenue under the Lord if you knew the Lord. And we have a time and opportunity to be able to witness. So don't, don't pass up the opportunity sometimes that's been given to us. Well, not only do I want you to see that there was a need for courageous faith, and uh, there really was a call to courageous faith, uh, but thirdly, uh, there is a duty of courageous faith. A duty of courageous faith. Found in verses 14 through 16. What Abram could have done was to say, well, Lot. You're telling me about Lot? Listen, he deserves everything he gets. Lot made a bad choice. And God's just trying to teach him a lesson. Now, sometimes with my spiritual gift, <laughs> that might would have been my answer. But praise God, it wasn't Abram's answer. Abram was ready right then and there to drop whatever it was that he was doing. Uh, we, we don't find him going over to the other people and saying, hey, take care of the animals, take care of whatever. He's, he was willing to drop whatever, leave everything with 318 men and march as far as he needed to go in order to go over there and to save Lot and his family. He was willing. How willing are you? Sometimes when somebody might give us a call and it's in a bad moment of time and we're in the middle of doing something, somebody calls and says, hey, uh, you know, this is a need. Now, as a pastor, I understand that well. There are times that you get calls, and they're not, they're not convenient times many times, but you have to drop what you're doing. Sometimes you've been out in the yard doing yard work, and you need to drop and go to the hospital, and you, you have to go get cleaned up real quick and get your clothes on and go because there's an emergency. And I tell you what, I'll be ready always, always be ready. That when someone comes, some need is there, that we're able to meet that need, the duty of courageous faith. But what is, uh, but that's not what Abram, he didn't just, uh, he didn't just say you deserve it. He went after it. 
He went after you. And so it's difficult to help those who have despised your advice. Abram had been teaching him over the years, remember. Uh, but there was, uh, there was disgruntledness between uh, the, those herdsmen. And Abram chose to leave and to go his separate ways. Now we know that was the will of God and originally for Abram that he would leave his family. But now we find that he is now going after his family. He's going after them to rescue his uh, nephew in order to help him. And we find next week, we're really going to find. I want you to be here for that. To see exactly what took place there. Abram gathered his servants, 318 of them, and they were ready to fight when necessary because of the number of servants. Uh, it tells you how large the herds and the, and the crops and all the things in which he had to take care of were. Are you prepared to go and rescue the perishing today? The size of a church really doesn't matter, does it? You get no amens on that. Oh, we'd love to have more people. We'd love every Sunday for the altars to be full of people that needs the Lord Jesus as their Savior. But God, when he looks at churches, doesn't look at them by their size. He looks at their obedience. He looks at whether they can be trusted. He looks at whether they're ready. He looks at whether they're capable. Can I tell you, when uh, someone was sent to Abram, that they, they knew that Abram had 318 men and that he had a great faith in God and that uh, he could trust him to go and do whatever was necessary. God was going after Lot. You understand? Could it be that God is going after you today? Could it be that there's something in your life that God's after? He wants to deal with you today. And he was going to deal with Lot and try to get Lot uh, to be persuaded that Lot needs to turn and, and turn back to God and do what God wanted him to do. Well, Abram had prepared them for this moment, moment, not knowing that this would be exactly what would happen, but reading and studying the Word, praying, meditating, yielding, serving. That's what he did all the time. Is that your characteristic of your life? Are you reading the Word of God? Are you studying the Word of God? Are you praying through the Word of, about the Word of God and in the Word of God as we're studying on Wednesday nights? Are you meditating on the Word of God? Are you shutting everything down, no TV, no radio, uh, taking the Word of God, the passage in which you've read, sitting by yourself in a quiet location, and meditating on the Word of God? That's what the Bible says that we're to be about doing. We're to meditate on the Word of God. And then after we find those things that the Lord has said, we're to yield to Him. We're to do what He says. And we're to serve. We're to be servants. Abraham divided to conquer. It gave the appearance that there was a larger group that was coming after them. And they surrounded uh, the area in which they were coming in. So 318 men didn't just march together and go in one area and go down the aisle here and go out in, in order to do that. No, they separated, got and surrounded the thing. And it looked like there was a much larger army. And it caught them off guard. It caught them by surprise. And they conquered. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter what size you are, how many people you got, God will give you a plan, and God's the one that's in charge of it. And when we follow Him, God will see it through. It'll be successful. It will. I'll tell you what, smaller churches many times do more than larger churches. They do. I'm amazed at this little place right here. Well, this, this place does some amazing things. People serving, working, doing something all the time. And I, I talk to pastors all the time. I go to eat lunch with them. I know some large churches are begging people to serve. I know a church this morning that doesn't, will not have enough people in their nurseries in order to take care of the kids. Matter of fact, they never do. But I would say to you that we don't always have them either. So we need to serve. We need to be ready. Well, this is an amazing thing that took place. They didn't have automobiles. They couldn't fast, move fast in order to get to where they were going. Matter of fact, they had to travel 120 miles on foot. Can you imagine traveling 120 miles on foot? It wasn't just flat land in which they traveled on. They, they had to go through hills and go up places and get to where they were going. Uh, listen, the, the paths were just old rugged paths in which they had to walk and get to where they were going. 100, 120 miles, these 318 men had to go. Now, if you're going 120 miles on foot, it takes quite a bit of water and quite a bit of food in order to sustain you, to get you where you're going, and to be ready to go to battle when you get there. Can I tell you? It takes a lot of preparation to be ready to serve God. Sometimes we have to travel great distances in order to do that. Listen to me this morning. 
Sometimes we won't even go across the street and talk to our neighbor. I know people who won't even speak to their neighbor because their neighbor's treated them bad and, they, and, they, and in, their, in their spiritual condition, as we're supposed to be, we end, up not, we end up treating them like they treated us. We shun them, don't want to speak to them. They come outside and we turn our head the other way. Well, I want to tell you, these 318 men traveling 120 miles we're dedicated to the cause. How dedicated are you to the cause today? We need to be dedicated. Can I tell you Christianity is not for wimps? It is not for wimps. Well, I've learned that over the years. I've been ridiculed. I've had people come up and want to hit me with their fist. I've been talked about. I mean, for years. Different people, different ways, whatever. That's just what happens in the Christian life. The, Jesus said, if I've got to go through persecution, you're going to go through persecution. If I've got to go through things, you're going to go through things. So what do we do? It's not that we just uh, you know, run off our back. We, we, we make sure that we go to the Lord with the things that come our way. We take it to God and ask God, help us to act right, to do right, to respond correctly. Have I always done that? No. Usually God teaches me a lesson when I don't. How about you? The Christian battle, is, as I said, is not for wimps. It's for those that have commitment. Can you be counted amongst the 318? When the Lord comes immediately to you, are you ready to jump out and say, yes, I will? I hope you are. As a church body, we ought to be out here reaching out to people. Especially during this time when they, we don't know whether people are going to live or die. They're dying daily with this virus. We don't know if someone in this room will be the next one, including myself. We have no way of knowing those things. We ought to be ready, don't you think? We ought to be ready. Well, Abram had great success. It says in the passage that he brought back all the people. He didn't lose a one. He brought back all the people and all their stuff and all Lot's stuff. And he brought it all back. Successful with 318 men. Got his nephew, brought him back. The thing is, is what did he do? You see, sometimes we get rescued out of our trouble. And I've said this to a number of groups over the years. And I've even said it to you in here. So, sometimes the, the, the people need to go through what they're going through in order for God to get their attention. I can tell you this, God had Lot's attention. Now, did Lot respond correctly? We won't learn that today. But I'll tell you what, many times we don't respond correctly either. Oh, God's got our attention. All of a sudden, things begin to work out, and we go back back to who we were, knowing that God spoke to us about the things in which it was going on, and he, you knew that you needed to make a change in your life, but we refused to make the changes. Why is it that we as believers, when we know that we're supposed to be those that confess our sins and repent of our sins and to be right with God, say I have such a hard time of saying, yes, God, I want to be right with you today. Why do we have such a hard time? No matter what a person has done, they need to be freed out of the devil's grip. Isn't that what Jesus came for? He came to seek and to save those that were lost. And we need to understand that what he came for is what we're to be about. We're his ambassadors and we're his representatives and we're to be the ones that go out and to try to save those that are perishing. So let me ask you the question this morning, how is your faith? Do you have courageous faith? Very little faith? Can I remind you that Faith, just as a grain of mustard seed, can move a mountain. In the mountains of North Carolina this morning, there was an earthquake. It's the largest earthquake they've had since I think it was 1916. The earth moved the mountains, you understand? We, as a grain of mustard seed, we can have 5.1 on our Richter scale. We can cause things to be moved to. You understand? What decision do you need to make today? 
related to the message. What has God been speaking to you about as we've been preaching? What do you need to do? What decision do you need to make to make your life more like what Jesus wants your life to be about? Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord. Today, why not today? What stops you from giving your life to Christ today? Whatever it is today, don't hesitate. When the invitation begins to do whatever it is God's told you to do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you, Lord, for this, the example of Abraham, the courageous faith in which God, he exemplified. Lord, he showed. He was obedient to whatever it was that God you told him to do. Thank you, God, for the example. And Lord, I do pray for each of us today here. Uh, God, sometimes we're not prepared. When the call comes to us to be the one to rescue someone or to help someone, and Lord, maybe it is that we uh, was like a uh, lot, and God, we've moved further into the world, and God, we're further away from you than we were a week ago or a year ago. God, I pray today that, God, you'd speak to us clearly, that, God, you'd find us repentant people. You tell us, God, that as believers we're to confess our sins unto you. You're faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. And so, God, I'm asking you to do that this morning. I pray for someone or anyone or many that might be here today that's never given their life to Christ, maybe out there watching by way of television, God, that you would draw them to yourself, God. Today would be the day that they say yes to Christ. God, I pray that your will will be done this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.